a warm welcome to Nova Gene Roundtable Discussion for June 2022. The title, Powering Agri Genomics, Solution Tailored for Research Towards Sustainable Agriculture. So my name is Chris, and I will be serving as the moderator for today's webinar. So some of the audience may not be familiar with the term agri genomics. Some of you may already be part of the ecosystem in driving for sustainability in agriculture. Be it farmers, breeders, or scientists, I hope you will walk away with greater awareness of how the latest technology in next generation sequencing can help you in making informed cultivation and breeding decision in the 21st century. So some simple housekeeping rule before we start the event. First, attendees are mute by default, so there will not be any disruption by late comer. And please address your question in the chat box, uh, stating your name and affiliation. Uh, and please try to keep the question short. Third, you are welcome to use the chat box throughout the event. We will cover as many questions as possible. Fourth, Please complete a survey when you exit the Zoom event to help us enhance our experience and cater more of such scientific topic of interest to you. And lastly, for further inquiries on Novo Gene product and services, please reach out to our representative or email us at marketing email at novogeneait.sg. Next, we, today we have uh, three guest speakers. So I'm very pleased to uh, invite the guest speaker for the event. First, we have Professor Robert Park, Director of Zero Rust Research at the School of Life and Environmental Science from University of Sydney in Australia. Professor Park is also the Judy and David Coffey Chair of Sustainable Agriculture and winner of Australia prestigious Eureka Prize for Leadership in Innovation and Science for 2020. Professor Park research focuses on plant biologies and production ecology and evolution, genetics and genomics. Second, we have uh, Dr. Jaco Saloyabi, Assistant Professor in Bioinformatics for Molecular Biology and Genomics in Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Dr. Jaco's research interest is in population genomics and system biology. Last but uh, not least, we have Ms. Wan Lu, Senior Product Manager for Novaging Amia, will be sharing with us the different technology platform that Novaging offers. So it's in my honor to be moderating this event with three great speakers who will be sharing their knowledge and expertise in every genomic. Thank you. Next, I'd like to give a brief introduction of Novaging, who is the main sponsor for the webinar. Founded in 2021, Novaging is global leading service provider for genomic services. We own the world first intelligent NGS uh, platform called Falcon. We'll be able to serve uh, and deliver uh, NGS procedure uh, in a very optimized manner for sample preparation to data releasing. Our regional AMA office, you know, including Asia Pacific, Middle East and Africa is located in Singapore. Our sales team are planted across the region in Japan, Australia, Hong Kong, Taiwan, India and Dubai, in addition to our network of global partners. In Novaging, we also own a uh, provide different kinds of uh, genomic services from genome, transcriptome, microbial, epigenomics, and oncology. We also have with us a diverse platform, including Illumina Novasi, long reach sequencing, such as PET BioSQL, and of course, Nemopor. Our experience and access to diverse systems and protocols allow us to deliver the best possible in result to support our customer research. And with the support of the research community, we have been actively publishing and participating in collaboration. To date, we have more than 790 publications and 40 patents. Novaging also serves more than 300 customers including research institutions, uh, both government and corporate, and over 6,000 projects annually from 15 different countries across the EMEA region. And next, I would like to introduce the agenda for the talk today. 
This session aims to connect with professionals to discuss about the future, trend, advancement, and also the impact of genomic application or agriculture research. As a user of our genomic services, we would love to hear your thoughts and opinion on NGS application via the chat box. And lastly, also do uh, stay with us till the end of the event as we'll be making a special announcement. So the very first question. Let's start off with something simple, yet it's the most important question for today's topic. Agriculture is integral to the human society. From the time of the Neolithic revolution about 12,000 years ago, humans started farming as a way to obtain reliable food supply. And from agriculture, you have settlement, you have cities, and then you have civilization. So this, is, this shows how important agriculture is to the human society. Today, we have 7 billion population to feed. And population number is not the only concern we have. So I would like the panelists to share with our audience what are the, some of the main concerns of agriculture today. Shall we start with uh, Professor Robert first? Okay. How's that, okay? okay. Yeah, look, I think it's very simple um, from the point of view of what the main concerns of agriculture today are. And I've stated that um, here across the top of the screen, pretty much we need uh, sustainable production of more food to feed more people with fewer inputs in the face of climate change. Um, this is important, not only from the point of view of um, feeding people, but if we want to live in a peaceful world, well, people need to be fed. I think this was very well stated by a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Norman Borlaug, who was the 1970 Peace Prize, uh, Nobel, Nobel Peace Prize winner, um, who, and I heard Norm say this on more than one occasion, uh, you can't build a peaceful world on empty stomachs and human misery. So if we want to have a peaceful world and a fair world in future, we need to make sure that everyone is, is well fed. And of course, with the pressures um, facing us with climate change um, and increased uh, population, then clearly we need to do um, we need much, much better food production. We need to be smart about what we do. How do we do that? Well, um, can we cut down more forests to, to grow more crops? No, I don't believe we can. We've already done far too much of that already. Uh, can we increase production per unit area? Well, yes, there are still genetic gains to be had um, in crops, in the kinds of crops I work on and cereal crops, but, um, but those gains have really plateaued um, in recent times. So certainly a lot of challenges there in increasing production per unit area. The other area which is um, particularly close to the work that I do is looking at plant diseases and reducing their impact in, in plant production. It's been estimated that um, diseases reduce plant production by about 30% globally. And it's those last two there, I think, that, are get, that hold the key to, to um, producing more food more sustainably in future. And they are really um, based on sound genetics and genomics. So the, um, the genetics and the genomics that we're doing today and the improvements that are going to happen in future are going to be absolutely critical to achieving uh, or addressing, I should say, those concerns. Thank you. Thank you. So next, shall we have Dr. Jaco to share your thoughts? Okay. So I have a very similar points as, as Robert here, here had. So, so uh, I think the main concern in the future is the climate change. So it's going to affect the available land area for different crops. So, so basically they are going to move uh, towards north mostly. So um, also we need to have this, this sustainable agri agriculture. So, so we need to reduce somehow the carbon footprint of agriculture. So it, it's now producing 21 to 37% of total greenhouse gases. So, so some ways of, of doing that uh, are definitely needed in order to reduce the, the uh, climate change also. And um, as Robert said, the, the mankind is, is, has more needs. So, so people demand better quality food and, and, and more of it. Uh, luckily, the um, population is not going to increase that much anymore. So, so it's going to plateau at some point but people still eat more food and people want to have better quality food and, and more diverse, more healthier diets. So, so uh, um, more uh, plant-based um, uh, 
um, food and so on. The problem is, is, uh, is that the land area is not going to increase. So, so we, we can't really cut down more forests. So, so we need to develop the, the existing cultivars so that they give more yield. And, uh, and uh, um, one uh, good way of, of decreasing or, uh, or increasing the yield is to have uh, um, less uh, pathogen attacks and so on. Uh, of course, because the climate is changing, we have global warming, so we need to extend the growth zones of, of existing cultivars to cope with climate change so, so that we can grow um, our crops in, in uh, warmer climates uh, where, where they tolerate more heat stress, uh, more, more drought and all that, um, and so on. So here's a, uh, one slide which shows how much, uh, for example, the corn, potato, rice, and wheat production is going to change uh, in the in the in global uh, by by 2050. So this is only 30 years from now, and then uh, we see from here already that the boreal zone is going to um, have more arable land. So so we can cultivate more uh, potato, corn, rice, and wheat in there. But then what's going to happen uh, in India, China, Southeast Asia is that we are going to reduce. So, so we have uh, big losses uh, if, they, if the current cultivars are, are being cultivated still in here. So, so we need to develop better crops that, that tolerate the, the future climates. Okay. okay, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Jaco. Uh, so I actually do agree with both our panelists that climate change is one of the key uh, topics that we need to work on. I think this is if you have uh, listened to the uh, World Economic Forum happening in Davos this year. So climate change is also one of the big uh, key issues that many uh, world leaders are looking into. So next, I would like to have the panelists to also share with us what are some of your research goals and how can they help to address the concern that we have. So shall we have uh, Professor Robert first? Okay, so um, yeah, look, research goals um, and how can they prove in agriculture? Well, I've already uh, mentioned that the, the focus of my research is on reducing the impact of diseases in plant production. Um, I specifically work, my research group works on a group of pathogens known as the rusts. Um, and these are amongst some of the most damaging um, pathogens in agriculture, I should say in wheat production. So there was a study done a few years ago that estimated more than 20% of um, world wheat production is lost due to pests and diseases. Uh, that's about 180 million tonnes of production, enormous loss. Um, but of those pests and diseases, um, the three rusts that I mentioned, uh, leaf rust, stem rust and stripe rust, are considered amongst the most damaging. So there's uh, images of those three pathogens or those three diseases uh, there on your screen. The one on your right, for example, is uh, known as stripe rust. This is a pathogen that has had enormous um, impact globally over many years now. Uh, I was involved in a study undertaken by some colleagues at the University of Minnesota, and they estimated that annual losses just due to stripe rust, so this is only one of those three rust pathogens, right, stripe rust, annual losses of about 5.47 million tonnes per year globally, approaching a billion US dollars. And if you look at average wheat consumption across the world, that's enough to feed about 35 million people. So as I said, just one of those rust pathogens um, causing that much damage. So our work really focuses on looking at the genetics of um, resistance in plants to those rust diseases. Um, in the case of, um, well, what I should say is that we're very lucky that, uh, that nature has delivered us this suite of tools that we can use to control these pathogens. So over the many, many years that, that plants have um, evolved, uh, they've co-evolved with their pathogens. And in response to that, they've evolved these resistance genes. Um, and in most parts of the world, uh, these resistance genes have been deployed in, for example, wheat. Um, and when they have been deployed um, strategically, let me say, they really have been the basis or the foundation of successful disease control. So in Australia, it was estimated uh, about 10 years ago that genetic resistance to rust diseases in wheat alone saves our economy about a billion dollars a year. 
So we know this works um, and we know that it's a clean green approach because it reduces reliance on um, pesticides. So in essence, that's really the, the research goal of my group is to, um, is to find and implement genetic solutions to uh, these rust diseases in wheat. Um, but we also work on other cereals and in recent times we've been working on some other rust pathogens as well, um, not only of agricultural plants, but of forestry um, plants as well. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Robert. Yeah, so I think when it comes to uh, disease and uh, pest resistance, this is the issue that is being faced globally. And the use of pesticide, as I think I would like your comments on it towards the second half, because I think quite a lot of the uh, researchers are also facing this type of issue. Should we use more pesticide to control the pests? Or should we look into bioengineering to generate pest resistance strains? So I think we'll, I would like to have your comments on that in the second half. So next we have uh, Dr. Jaco to share with us your thoughts. Okay. So uh, let me first introduce my past research. So, so um, um, basically I, I did my uh, postdoc first on plant stress signaling and then the postdoc on gut microbiome, so microbial ecology. So, uh, and then after that, I moved on to, more, to uh, genomics. So, so the, the silver birch genome uh, was published in 2017 in Nature Genetics. So I was there the first author. And then this Litchi genome was, was published this year uh, in, in January. Uh, then then uh, uh, we did also the uh, Darrow's blueberry uh, genome uh, that was published also this year. Um, and then right now we have uh, look, uh, we are looking into uh, uh, silver birch pathogens. So, so one one uh, medically interesting fungi that that uh, is infecting birds is this Inonotus obliquus. And then uh, another paper that we have in is the Coffea arabica uh, uh, coffee genome paper, the where we sequence the, the coffee and the, its diploid uh, progenitors. So uh, in the litchi. Uh, the, the major finding that, that uh, uh, I had was, was that I, when analyzing the populations in Litsi, it appeared that uh, this kind of uh, breeding scheme uh, was applied or, or, well, um, um, in, in Litsi, so, so that there was a natural split into two populations in, in, uh, uh, in the Litsi uh, population in general, so, so Yunnan and Hainan wild populations. And then in both of those populations, some uh, superior cultivars were picked, and then they were uh, uh, used in, in further breeding efforts. And then eventually, uh, these two lines were crossed to produce um, even better cultivars. So, so this is so-called heterosis, so heterozygote advantage, so highly uh, heterozygous genome that, that rose from, from this kind of cultivation. So now the question is that is similar kind of breeding scheme used in other species as well. So um, this is a, a, where I first addressed this in the coffee and it, it seems that there is something similar going on in there too. So, so the paper is still in review. So I, I'm not going to talk that much about that. Uh, but then of course, the, the major question is that uh, if there is this kind of breeding scheme, so can we uh, develop uh, some rules based on genomics and genome sequencing, how we can pick these cultivars for breeding so, so that we can accelerate the breeding process. So, so the litchi breeding took about 2000 years. So, so we don't want to wait that long to, to get the, the better cultivars out. Another aspect that I'm still looking at with the silver birch is that um, can we, uh, how can we do this breeding with trees? So, um, trees are producing quite a lot of different kinds of fruits and then the problem with trees is that the breeding uh, is, is very slow. The generation times take uh, tens of years uh, in some cases. So uh, with, with silver birch what we are doing is that we can actually accelerate the flowering in there. So, so we can make one generation of uh, silver birch trees grow in, in six months to one year and then this way we can actually try out this breeding uh, with, with this uh, um, three model species. Um, and, and then the idea is that uh, we do, uh, we grow this, this kind of mapping population and then we 
do phenotyping in an automated platform. So, so this, this kind of robotic conveyor belt type uh, platform. And then that way we can do large scale, large scale association analysis by, by do, uh, combining the genomic markers with these automated phenotyping results from, from this same population. Um, this kind of approach can be used for basically any kind of tree where if, if you just have um, a way to accelerate the, the, the generation time in there. Now, uh, what my main goals uh, and, and why I'm doing is that uh, basically uh, the, the fastest agricultural gains can be obtained by applying this genomic analysis to plants where there is less established breeding practices. So those plants which have been basically taken out from the forest or, or, and then grown in the field. So, um, so those species uh, can uh, produce faster gains in, in, uh, uh, in agriculture. Uh, it's also quite clear now that the interface between this agriculture and forestry is becoming less clear cut. So, so uh, many of these fruit trees are just trees picked out from the forest and then uh, uh, people have started cultivating them. So, so they are basically forest trees. So, so now uh, we can apply plant breeding approaches for those trees uh, to uh, pro produce cultivars with increased yield. So, so like, like the lychees is one example of that. Uh, then uh, on, on the other end then, so uh, agriculture is moving slightly towards forestry. So, so people are talking about having polyculture crop, crops, for example, to increase yield and then reduce pathogen effects. And so on. So, so then it would be not just monoculture, big fields, but then, then uh, lots of uh, different crops grown at the same time. So the technology is um, uh, developing, and then we can actually do this nowadays much better than the, in the earlier times. The genomics provides added value to these things. So basically, the, the conservation genomics, of, of course, is important. So, so we can sequence the threatened species and then identify possibly novel cultivars that, that actually with some development could produce uh, very good quality fruits and so on. Uh, um, so so this, this uh, genomics can be used then for developing new agriculturally important crops and then also fungi. So, so uh, people are eating a lot of uh, uh, fungus-based uh, food also in, in here in, in, in Asia. Uh, then uh, one important thing is to understand these genomic principles underlying this plant breeding. So um, basically these genomic components of heterosis and disease resistance that are coming out from the, from the Litchi paper, for example. And then um, we see so very similar things in the coffee Arabica. So it is kind of continuation of that kind of work. So uh, if we understand these genomic components underlying these, these different traits, then, then we could accelerate the plant breeding. So we, can, we could hopefully skip several generations and then take, take, uh, um, produce high uh, uh, quality cultivars already within a, a lesser amount of generations. And then uh, uh, we need to combine this automated phenotyping and genomics so to accelerate the plant breeding. So, so can we, we can do it in large scale and then in an objective way. And then we uh, need both sequencing and population genomics uh, skills for doing this. So, so either in collaboration or then uh, develop those both capabilities within the same lab, which is of course very, very difficult. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, Dr. Jaco. So actually I'm very interested with the issues on uh, biodiversity. Especially, I think uh, there's quite a number of questions pertaining to biodiversity and uh, genetic breeding. So, are we helping uh, biodiversity when we come when if we use genetic breeding tools? So, I think that's one question that uh, quite a lot of uh, audience have in, uh, in mind. So, but we'll come to that in the later half of the webinar. So, moving on to the third questions. So. So as a researcher, how do you actually plan and incorporate genomic tools into your research? Because we can see that both our panelists have incorporated quite a number of different NGS tools. So could you share with us what is some of your thought processes? So Professor Robert, please. Uh, yeah, look, 
Um, as I said, the, the, the areas that I work in, um, my work research and my group's research focuses on rust diseases of cereals, wheat in particular, um, and the genomics tools that we have available to us today have allowed us to do things we could only have dreamed of, you know, even 10 years ago. Uh, why is that? Well, both the, the, the wheat and, and the rust pathogens that infect wheat are genetically complex. So if you look at wheat, uh, common wheat, um, it's a polypoid. So it's a hybrid between three diploid grass species. Um, that hybridization occurred thousands of years ago around the dawn of agriculture. Um, and as a result of that, it's a hexaploid um, and it has an enormous genome, much, much bigger than the human genome. Uh, of which some 80% comprises repetitive sequences. So wheat is an incredibly large and complex genome. And um, whilst we've done a lot of really nice genetic work on that in the past and breeding and, and, um, and improvement, um, we now have uh, available to us reference uh, genomes that we, that's really um, accelerating our research. Uh, when you come to the rust pathogens, very, very complex. So these are fungal pathogens. Um, they are dicaryotic. Um, so they're functional diploids, but they have two haploid nuclei in each cell. And each, each of those um, haploid um, nuclei, there's a lot of heterozygosity. So it's like having two genomes, um, two haploid genomes per cell in an organism. So whenever we do genome sequencing, uh, and assemblies on rust pathogens, we're trying to we're trying to separate out and assemble two separate haploid genomes. As far as fungi are concerned, they've got large genomes. Um, we recently sequenced one of these. It was the largest fungal genome ever assembled, and it came out at a haploid genome size of about a gigabase um, pair. And we found that about ninety percent of that um, was repetitive sequences. So really, these. Um, Applying these um, genomic tools has really allowed us to drill down into the, the genomes of these organisms and help us uh, really look, start to look at how they interact. So what we've been doing uh, is using the sequencing and transcriptomics to help us understand how wheat defends itself from fungal rust pathogens. So this is the resistance side in the host and how we can better use that resistance um, to um, incorporate enduring resistance or durable resistance to these pathogens in new wheat, high yielding wheat cultivars. And then on the, on the pathogen side of the equation, looking at how these fungal rust pathogens suppress the immune system of wheat to infect. So they are really, um, re they've really developed a, a very close uh, parasitic relationship with wheat um, and to the point where they actually secrete a lot of small proteins into the host to suppress the host's immune system and basically hijack the physiology of the host to, to divert photosynthate uh, away from the developing brain um, and, in, and support their own growth. So those, um, those genomic technologies really have been amazing and they've allowed us, as I said, to do stuff that uh, 10 years ago we could, uh, wouldn't have even dreamt as possible. Um, so I'll leave it there. Um, and um, I'm, I'm gonna come back and talk a little bit more about some of the, the details uh, that I've, um, points of raised there a bit later on. Thank you, Professor Robert. So shall we have uh, Dr. Jacob? Okay, so just one slide for me. So basically, um, uh, sequencing everything is the key. So so um, in my work, so so if you have a new species that, that uh, where the reference genome is not available, then, then we need, you need to have high quality long read assembly. So, so BackBio or Oxford Nanobo, and then we are nowadays, I would recommend the BackBio Hi-Fi for, for doing that. So, so it it's, uh, uh, seems to be much better than the, the Nanobo right now. Um, and then um, in addition to long read sequencing, then Illumina whole genome sequencing or, or short, short, short read sequencing in general is, is the basic building block of everything. So, so in population analysis, it gives a very clear advantage over any kind of marker-based approach. So, so RAT-seq or, or then, then uh, exome sequencing or anything because it's, it's unbiased. So um, you have always some type of selection going on in the, if you focus, for example, on, on on uh, gene coding regions. Uh, uh, Illumina gen genome sequencing can be used for quick studies on new species. So, so if you do high uh, coverage uh, sequencing 
of, of the genome on Illumina, you can get a reference a kind of draft genome assembly, which you can use for analyzing um, um, some things to get some idea about the species. Um, it can be also used for screening interesting genotypes to see if there is something uh, going on. So, for example, in the uh, silver birch genome paper, we found uh, just by sequencing one interesting genotype, a stop conon in, in one essential gene, which produces this, this uh, 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 weird phenotype in that individual. So, so you can uh, uh, get lucky just by chance by, by doing just one Illumina sequencing round on, a, on an interesting genotype. Uh, of course, then in addition to genome sequencing, you need to have transcriptomics. So, so you need that for functional studies to see what is actually expressed. And, and uh, right now, uh, research field is doing more and more single cell approaches. So single cell transcriptomic sequencing is, is um, very much the hot topic nowadays. And then, of course, uh, to complement these, then, then uh, uh, for example, attack seek and different approaches for sequencing the methylation status of the genome, then uh, they provide information about the accessible uh, genome region. So, so this attack seek is something that we are also developing in, in Helsinki for silver birch and, and trees in general. So, uh, these take time. So, so basically, um, it's not that simple when, when you do it outside of a model species. So it, it appears that every species is very different. So maybe be patient. Yeah. OK, so but just a quick question. So I can see that both of you have used uh, different, lots of different uh, platform. So do you have any like face any issue when you try to integrate different platforms together? So maybe uh, our panelists can share their experience. Do you want to have an answer now or later? Yeah. Yes, I think this is a very uh, important thing because we, we have so many different plan, kind of platforms. So how do you actually merge all these kind of data together and during the process? So should you trust platform A or should you trust platform B? So I think this is some of the issues that the researcher will need to uh, decide when they try to incorporate different kinds of platform. So could you share with us like, maybe some of your experience when you are working with, say, uh, uh, Nemopause or uh, PetBio or merging Illumina together or even merging genomics and transcriptomics. Do you have any like uh, experience or issue that you face during this type of uh, doing the incorporation of these NGS tools? So they have different kinds of error models. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, how, how these errors are produced in PacBio is different from the Nanopo and so on. Yes. So, so basically, uh, and a, a blind assembly using those two together doesn't necessarily produce a good result. So, so um, uh, I would recommend that you um, first do error correction for those reads before doing a pulled assembly of the two. So if you have some kind of hybrid, so um, um, there are different ways, for example, using Illumina data for doing the error correction in both of those independently first and then doing the, the assembly after that. Uh, for short read sequencing, then uh, there's not that much difference in the platforms. So, so we have been doing some compa comparison between the uh, BGI's DNA nanoball and the, the Illumina. Uh, we don't see any massive differences when, when we look at the SNP calls in, in, in the same individuals, for example. So, so uh, I think uh, um, if, if you uh, combine the two and then do the normal uh, quality control mappings, uh, uh, like, uh, like using the GATK pipelines, and then that, that appears to work uh, okay. Um, and then... then uh, combining short read sequencing and long read uh, uh, sequencing, then that, that's basically what, what everybody's doing. So, so first you do the um, assembly. Quite often you do it with, with long reads first, and then you do polishing using the short reads. So, so that's very standard approach. And so um, and, and that's not, uh, not uh, problematic at all. OK, understood. Mm -hmm. So maybe uh, Professor Robert, do you have anything to add on? Yeah, yeah, I'll just uh, share my screen again. So the concerns that we have um, are cost. 
read length sequencing accuracy and amount of quantity of DNA required. Some of these uh, JARCO has already, um, has already discussed, uh, but I'll give you some of our, um, experience, our perspective on, on that from our experiences. So one of the big challenges we face working on these on the rust pathogens at least, is that they do not grow in eccentric culture. You cannot grow them on agar. So we are stuck with growing these things on plants. That means it's very difficult to keep them pure. Um, and then when we, we do that, we have to increase, I don't know if you can see this Petri dish here in the, in the uh, beaker in the right top right hand corner. We have to increase, we have to build up really large amounts of spores from which we extract DNA. So it's really, really difficult for us to get our DNA to start with. Um, so we want to, we don't want any chance of anything going wrong in the sequencing or getting, getting poor information. Um, I've also mentioned that these pathogens are dicaryotic. So each cell has two nuclei. In the very, very early uh, attempts that we had at sequencing using short read sequencing, like just, just Illumina, um, what we found was that we would end up with a collapsed haploid representation of a genome. Um, the two genomes are different, but not different enough to be actual, actually resolved. Um, what we found is that now with, um, with, long, with PacBio long read sequencing, to start with and, and the polishing using um, Illumina sequencing that Jarko mentioned, we were able to do phased dicaryotic representation of those two haploid um, genomes. But the thing that really, really has accelerated this for us has been um, HiFi, PacBio HiFi, where we're getting much, much more accurate um, um, reads. Um, and that also has meant that we can go to lower coverage. So whereas before we were doing 100 plus X coverage, um, we were um, we are now actually able to do lower coverage and still get very good um, results from that pack bio high fight. Um, so an example of this was the work we did on Australopuxinia. This is myrtle rust, which is, has the largest fungal genome sequenced and assembled so far that we found was a, it's about a gigabase haploid size. Um, the first assembly we did with that, where we did the um, we I think it was pack bio sequel. Uh, or PS2, and then the polishing um, with the coverage that we could afford to do uh, based on the, and on also the DNA we had, our high performance computer at the Sydney University, here at Sydney University took four months to run that assembly. Four months, it was, it just took forever. Um, we've rerun it recently with HiFi data and it took about a week. So that, that much, the, the higher quality in the, in, the, in the sequencing has meant that the bioinformatics has had a much, much easier time in actually doing the assembly. Um, the other thing that I would mention that we're now using in conjunction with the high fire sequencing is chromosome confirmation capture sequencing, high C. And this has allowed us to actually scaffold um, our contigs into pseudo molecules. And we're getting uh, telomere to telomere uh, chromosome um, assemblies now, again, that we're able to separate out into those two haploid nuclei. Um, and as I've mentioned before, I said, I've already said it a couple of times, this is the kind of stuff we could only dream about uh, doing uh, 10 years ago. The ability to actually have chromosome level assemblies um, that are haplophased um, into those two nuclei. Even with these really, really large genomes, um, extracting DNA from these pathogens that are obligate pathogens and really, really hard to get DNA from. Okay, um, I see. Yeah, I think the issues of heterozygosity was one of the uh, kind of uh, big issues when it comes to selecting the type of uh, NGS uh, services. So I think both of the, our panelists also work with uh, heterozygous uh, species. So is there, do you have like anything to add on with regard to uh, trying to resolve the uh, heterozygous uh, diversity issues in the different uh, species? Um, that's not the problem in, in uh, allopoly diploids. So, so in those species where uh, there are two diploid parents, uh, different species, uh, parent species. So, so the problem is in autopolyploids when you have uh, uh, the same species having whole genome duplication. So, so then, then uh, uh, those species will be very difficult to analyze because then, uh, of course, all the uh, copies of the of the genome are the same. So, so uh, with allopolyploids, the genome when you do genome assembly, the, they usually assemble separately. So, so you can do assembly quite easily that way. But then in, in uh, allopolyploids, you need to develop 
uh, new ways to to actually solve this problem so like like in the um, for example sweet potato uh, paper the, the, what they did so basically what you do is is that you do um, read back facing so so uh, you identify snips that are specific to uh, each of the subgenomes and then try to span these snips using long reads for example or then high c data uh, to to combine these these uh, and then come up with these haplotype assemblies I see, I see. Okay, that's great. So moving on, I believe uh, next question was on some of the key considering selection of the genomic tool, but I believe uh, Professor Robert have already shared uh, his advice, uh, expertise. And Dr. Jaco, do you have anything you'd like to add on? Yeah, sure. Um, so basically, uh, so key consideration is, of course, you need to have a clear action plan before you do anything. So, so you need to have the, the uh, funding application that goes through, basically. So, so and then, of course, in, in, the, in the funding application, you define the main goal. And then uh, I su also suggest to have a secondary goal if the plan A doesn't work. So, so don't commit all your resources in the main goal if it just doesn't work out. So there might be some, some problems along the way, like, for example, in this, this uh, Tree breeding, uh, uh, it, it's uh, well. I, I said that the silver birch is, is flowering, uh, can be accelerated to flower uh, once a year, but then uh, uh, they don't necessarily make uh, female and male flowers uh, the, every year. So, so, uh, so then, then that may, makes it much much slower. And then that's why uh, also I had to develop a secondary goal for for this project. And so. Um, and then, uh, of course, this experimental setting then needs to uh, take into account both goals, so, so main goal and secondary goal, so that you can actually obtain or achieve both goals. Uh, when you are doing uh, using genomics tools then for this data then or population, uh, it, uh, I, I recommend it to be as general as possible, because then uh, if you do whole genome sequencing, it's non-biased. Um, so it, it basically makes it possible to study the unexpected uh, results that you get. So, so you can study if there would be some, some weird transposable element insertions or something like that, that explain these, these phenotypes or something, which you don't see if you just restrict your analysis to uh, some SNP arrays, for example, or something. Uh, of course, if you need to choose some kind of SNP array, then, then uh, understand the limitations of the platform so, so what you can do with that and then uh, and develop also a plan uh, how to go forward uh, to, to further analyze the results that that, that come out from uh, from uh, this this SNP array so so how to more clearly focus on, on certain genome region that is coming out uh, uh, from the analysis or something like that just some rules of thumb Right. I think for any researcher out there, funding is always a main concern. So next, uh, may I have uh, Wandu, our senior product manager for Novogene. Uh, so Novogene actually offers many different types of uh, NGS service. So could you share with our audience what are some of the services that Novogene offers and how it can help the agriculture community? Wandu, please. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, so as our speaker says, it is very important to make your goal very clear before do a specific project. So from a view of a sequencing provider, my advice to all uh, researchers who reach in this field, especially for uh, primary graduates, is that first thing you need to know a bit more about your species and also make it very clear uh, that what aim is your project. And also the second thing is about the cost because you know in the NGS market, it is uh, almost a very crucial 
factor to determine the uh, sequences you use by the cost you have. So make it clear and have an idea of the cost of the platforms. And also a third thing, uh, uh, we recommend you to do a bit of paper reading if you are very fresh in this field to make it clear that what kind of sequencing platforms you can use. And also the last but not least, you need to communicate a bit more with your uh, supervisors, with your lab mates, and also on web webinars of commercial company, both commercial companies and in uh, scientific institutes so that you can be very aware of what type of things and what kind of problems you may meet in the future studies. And as a service provider, I'd like to introduce a bit more about our uh, platforms and services. So first thing for Novogen, uh, you, as you know, we are a very leading sequencing provider worldwide. So we have a listed a very diverse and complete lineup here, including Nova, uh, including uh, Illumina and Pabell series, for example, NovaSeq and also Pabell SQL2. And this is the mo this are, these are the most widely used sequences in the agrogenomics field. And besides this, we also have some uh, other sequences or platforms which you could check in our website. And also for Illumina, for Packbell and Nanopole were all service, uh, certified service providers, which is very important for you to choose us when you want to do a sequencing project. And these are uh, some achievements we have uh, in the scientific, scientific field, which Chris has already introduced. And also, uh, I'd like to introduce a bit more about uh, agrogenomical services we have. We have a very complete solution uh, map for the sequencing projects, including from the very basic genome park for de novo sequencing, for whole genome sequencing, and for genotyping by sequencing. And these are three major tools we, uh, we, we meet when we try to solve agrogenomic problems and also some kind of epigenetics services and also uh, transcripto transcriptomic services. Uh, for de novo sequencing, actually Novogen is a very experienced in de novo sequencing as uh, Dr. Ray Chang Li, our founder, is a uh, very outstanding scientist to make, uh, make better achievements in this field. We could offer you with not only long read sequencing, which mentioned here, but we also could offer you assembly, annotation, comparative genomics, and pangenomics, pan even the genome database service, if you need. And also for the whole genome sequencing, we could start with variation detection, including SNP, INDEL, CV, and SV, and also some advanced analysis, including population structure, LD, selection sweep, and also GWAS and BSA and other population genetics uh, analysis. Uh, but if you are, uh, but you have needs of uh, simpler, simpler solutions, for example, genotype by sequencing, we could offer you also with that type of service, which is very cost effective for most of uh, the studies of cultivars or livestock, which is very mature in the research. And here I'd like to specially address uh, the services we are promoting now, the PacBio uh, sequencing projects. Uh, we have PacBio Hi-Fi sequencing services here, uh, majorly applied to two fields. The first is a de novo genome assembly, and the second is isoseq and also may, uh, maybe some uh, structure variation detection, but we haven't got the publications yet. The first thing for the Pabla Hi-Fi Genome, Genome Assembly, uh, as both uh, professors said, it is very uh, powerful in resolving the haplotypes. And also here, I'd like to introduce a bit about our recent publication 
for the Gaplis indica rice genome. Actually, here we apply high high far reads to the de novo sequencing uh, into the de novo sequencing project uh, plus a high C technology. Uh, together with uh, some modifications of algorithm, uh, specifically it's the uh, string, string, string graph optimization, we achieve a gapless indica rice genome, which is very useful for downstream uh, studies. And also the second part for isoseq, uh, because the accuracy and resolution of Pepper Hi-Fi reads are very high, so we could resolve the isoforms from each uh, subgenomes for a diploid, which is very useful and also very novel for uh, downstream analysis. And here are the two examples I'd like to introduce. So these are uh, all my introduction of our solutions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So last question we have. So where do you see agrigenomics moving forwards? So could you like share with us some of the vision and also what are some of the take home message you have for our audience? So maybe let's start with uh, Professor Robert. Yeah, so um, where do we see agrigenomics moving forward? I guess my comments today have been um, focused fairly specifically in the area that I work in, which is in disease control in plants. Um, but certainly, and we can see this happening already, um, we are developing already sustainable approach, new sustainable approaches to enduring disease control. And they're coming from an improved understanding of how pathogens infect crop plants and a better understanding of the plant immune system. And then using that information to accelerate uh, plant breeding and also to develop uh, new approaches to disease control. And importantly, one area I've not mentioned so far is in the area of diagnostics. So developing um, DNA-based diagnostics that are helping us to um, monitor the spread of rust pathogens. So just two examples of that. I've, I've said, so how, how pathogens infect crop plants, first one in the plant immune system. And I'll just give you an example of both of those and how we've, uh, how we've been using, um, <coughs> excuse me, agrogenomics. So one of these is a story um, of, of uh, some work that a, that a PhD student of mine did. We published this back in uh, 2017. Um, and he was able to isolate the first, what we call a virulence gene from a wheat infecting rust pathogen. So this a virulence gene um, produces a, uh, a protein that it's secrete, a small secreted protein that it secretes into wheat. And wheat has evolved the ability to identify that uh, small secreted protein and affect the protein and, um, and to use that recognition event to trigger uh, defense pathways and stop the invading rust pathogen. So in other words, um, the initiation of resistance. Um, how did we do that? Well, we did that through a mix of um, Illumina sequencing back in those days. I think we um, had some very preliminary PacBio um, sequence, but we used a spontaneous greenhouse mutant with virulence for the resistance gene SR50. Um, we did Illumina um, sequencing, I think it was 250 base pair, um, pair in reads. Um, and then we actually had to, because, because of a lack of a, of a stable transformation system in, in wheat, um, the cereals are no, uh, notorious for being very difficult to transform. We had to do the complementation in tobacco. So we were able to actually transform in the A virulence gene um, candidate, co-transform that along with the resistance gene and trigger the defense pathway in tobacco. Um, where we're going with that now, we would like to clone as many of these AVR genes as we can from rust pathogens. Firstly, um, as a way of developing uh, diagnostics, DNA-based diagnostics to determine the virulence and avirulence of isolates for important resistance genes in wheat. Um, the other thing that we, that we want to do is just to get a better understanding of how these things it's evolved. So how these pathogens actually acquire virulence? What are, the, what are these a virulence genes doing um, to change their functions so that they then become, the pathogen then becomes invisible to the plant's immune system? 
So, and this is quite a difficult thing to do. So we're using um, genome-wide association mapping. We're going back and sequencing a whole range of these rust isolates that have been phenotypically characterized. Um, fortunately for me, my predecessors um, stored a lot of these rust isolates in liquid nitrogen, and we've got them going back nearly 100 years. So we're going back and using um, resequencing and Illumina sequencing to sequence some of the older isolates and then coming in, coming in and using those reference assemblies to, um, to do GWAS, to find genomic regions associated with um, avirulence, to then use that information as, a, as an entry point to, uh, to isolate those AVR genes. So that's the first, um, first example. The second one, is in relation to the host. So what we're doing in, in cereals, um, I've given some examples here of wheat and barley, increasingly is actually drilling down and, and identifying, isolating or cloning the resistance genes that we've used in breeding new varieties with resistance to, to rusts. Um, and you can see there, I've listed 24 cereal rust resistance genes that have been isolated so far. A lot of work involved because these genomes are, as I said before, huge. Um, and there could even be a, a couple more that have been cloned since I put this slide together. But the interesting thing that's coming out of that work is as we isolate these resistance genes, we're seeing, we're, we're getting a better understanding of their function. And there seems to be an association of their function with their durability in agriculture when deployed. So what we found is that a lot of these genes that fall into the uh, nucleotide binding leucine rich repeat or receptor class um, tend to be notoriously non-durable. They're put out into agriculture and the pathogens can very easily change to overcome them. Um, there's a, a group there uh, that are kinase genes, a bit of a mix there in terms of their durability. But the important thing is those three transporter genes that we've found in wheat, and they've all proven to be um, pleiotropic, which means they give broad spectrum resistance against a range of pathogens. It's not just one. And, um, and they've proven durable in agriculture. So there's, a, there's a, um, a trend emerging there from that work um, that's telling us that these transporter genes are probably going to be more durable and more valuable for use in agriculture. The other thing, um, just finally, that, um, that isolating those genes has allowed us to do is to develop gene-specific diagnostic markers. So when we're doing accelerated breeding, um, accelerated generation and so on, rather than doing rust phenotyping, we can actually do DNA screening, marker-assisted um, breeding to determine whether individual um, breeding progeny carry those genes or not. And, uh, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Robert. So next we have uh, Dr. Jaku. Um. Okay, so basically I, I listed three things where, where I see the, the field moving forward. So, so first of all is the genetic modification of crop species. So, so uh, different bioengineering approaches. So for, for increasing nutrient content, so like this golden rice, uh, which is the, the rice which has vitamin A introduced in there. Then, then this latest uh, introduction was these tomatoes with, with vitamin D uh, incorporated there. Um, um, well, Robert was already talking about the pathogen resi resistance, so there are some cultivars already which contain the um, uh, resistance genes. And then, of course, there are uh, different uh, approaches for increasing the stress tolerance of, of crop cultivars. So, to, uh, for example, drought and, and all those things. Uh, the problem in, in uh, genetic modification is, is that the, it, it's still limited to uh, mostly single gene modification. So adding one gene or um, um, simple things to, to uh, construct these pathways. Um, in Europe, there's a big problem with the legislation. So, so genetically modifi modified organisms, so, so they, they are not really allowed. But then, uh, um, uh, well, the rest of the world is different. So, so then, then in, in Asia, it's, it's fine and, and, and US is fine, but then, there are still these ethical problems and, and, uh, in, in developing these things. Uh, then uh, we have these genomic approaches to breeding. So, so this genomic, selec genomic selection approaches, um, which have been used for cattle breeding for, for uh, well, a few decades now. Uh, so those will be implemented for crop species. So, so maize or, or, or corn is one good example of that, but then it will be coming for, for also for these difficult genomes like wheat, barley and rice. So we with, uh, with better uh, genomic tools that are available. So, so then, then we can increase the yield and then produce better cultivars that way. Uh, 
then uh, we can have also integration with wild ancestors. So, so uh, they are growing in the wild, so they have a better resistance to different pathogens. So, so this is one way of, of improving the, the resistance in the cultivar, cultivar species. Uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, the genomics approaches allow this fast lane development of novel cultivars. So, so you can uh, identify uh, some uh, wild uh, individuals which uh, 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 have some capabilities for, for, um, for uh, producing high quality uh, fruits or, or crops uh, already uh, after a few generations of, of breeding. Then, of course, there are these novel innovations that we don't really know about yet. So, so biofabrication, uh, different kinds of nanomaterials for, for producing uh, uh, different uh, things. So, so like uh, clothes or something. Uh, then synthetic biology. So you can take biosynthesis pathway and then produce these uh, um, important. Uh, um, for example, secondary metabolites or, or, or uh, nutrients in, in the labs. So, so you don't necessarily need to cultivate everything in the field where, where uh, you, you might have different uh, pathogens and the environment playing its, its big role. Of course, it doesn't work for everything, but then in some cases it works. So, so and then this is something that, that is going to come within the next uh, decade or two. Okay. Okay, thank you, Dr. Jaco. So we have quite a lot of questions from the audience, but I will just uh, uh, choose a few. So I think number one is uh, one key question, which I think I raised during the middle of the webinar is that, is the use of trick selection or gene editing in breeding, uh, are we killing or helping biodiversity? That's question number one. And second thing is uh, climate change, which is I think I saw another uh, questions that a lot of the audience is uh, asking. So are we doing enough to address climate change issues? And is sustainable agriculture the solution for small uh, cities? Because we are seeing a lot of new startups that focusing on vertical farming, urban farming. So uh, is that a solution for uh, city state, for example, like Singapore? And third thing is also uh, the issues of the micros and uh, plant interaction. I think uh, we have seen quite a lot of example that uh, how microbes can uh, uh, affect the plant health, but can microbes also help in uh, the ecosystem of the plant? So it actually promotes the plant health system instead. So these are three things I would like to hear from, the, uh, from both our panelists. So maybe uh, we start with Professor Robert. Uh, I think that Jaco is probably better qualified to talk about biodiversity than me, but I'll have, I'll have a go. Um, so that's the first question about um, gene editing and what it's doing to biodiversity. I'd argue that it's probably, if, it's, if, it, if from my perspective, if um, gene editing is contributing to disease resistance, um, it's reducing pesticide use in agriculture. Um, and as a result of that, it would be hopefully better beneficial to biodiversity. Um, there, are, there are concerns about insect populations around the world and the use of pesticides. Um, there are also concerns around the use of fungicides and their impact in, um, in non-target fungi, let me say, um, that are beneficial for crops, but also um, non-target fungi in the environment that are opportunistic uh, pathogens of humans. Um, so the use of the fungicides in agriculture they believe has given rise to isolates of opportunistic um, fungal pathogens of humans that are insensitive to those fungicides. And the chemistry of the fungicides we use on crops is the same as the chemistry we use in drugs to treat fungal infections in humans. So people are getting infected with um, isolates of things like aspergillus that are insensitive to DMI fungicides. Uh, the drugs that they're using to treat those people with DMI fungicides, and they're not, and there's a very high mortality rate. So that's a big concern. Um, from the point of view of overall biodiversity, just very general, and as I said, I think Jaco is far better qualified to speak about this than me. But um, but I think there's no question that um, with the way with um, human um, diet has gone, we are relying on very very just a handful of crops um, for the for for um, 
for our food supply. And there's evidence from a health perspective that perhaps that's not a great thing. And maybe that's not a great thing for biodiversity as well, if we're focusing too, too heavily on just a handful of crops. Um, do you want me to hand over to Joko now to, to, to address that question before we move on to the next one? Dr. Jaco, do you have anything to add on? I think Robert gave a very good answer here. So, so uh, I think one thing still is that uh, um, when people are breeding these crops, so, so people are selecting these elite cultivars and then, then crossing them together and so on. So, so uh, this decreases all the time, this biodiversity that's present in the crop species. So, so uh, and then basically uh, at the extreme, then, then everything is coming from a single uh, individual. So it could be like that. So, so then uh, the, the potential resistance um, that, that uh, is, is available in that one individual is not very big. So, so that way uh, there can be some pathogens when they overcome this one individual, then they overcome the whole crop. So, so this is this is what what is, is uh, happening with, with banana, for example. So, so uh, that's why we need to actually have this biodiversity present in in, in uh, plant breeding or crop breeding. So, so we can't really limit ourselves to to a single cultivar. And then, uh, okay, one way of of bringing this diversity back in, into uh, elite cultivars is to do this uh, gene editing. So, so um, adding these resistance genes that can uh, um, fight the pathogens and so on. But then it's not necessarily uh, uh, behind one single gene. So, so that requires actually quite a lot of research so that you can pinpoint that it's this gene that we need to modify in order to uh, uh, bring uh, pathogen resistance back to these crops. Uh, and then sadly also, so, so this, this pathogen is evolving. So, so basically, uh, if you do one editing, then the pathogen evolves and then uh, it overcomes the defenses for this one gene. So actually, uh, these single gene solutions not, don't necessarily work for a long time. So, so you have to have some other ways and then uh, the, the biodiversity is the only way of, of actually doing that. So, mm, I see. Uh, yeah. Okay, so next thing is on the climate change. Do we have any, any anything to add on? Maybe Joko can go first on that one and I'll follow. Uh, what was the exact question? Could you repeat? I think it was, are we doing enough for climate change? And is sustainable agriculture the solution to small cities? Mm, yes. Okay, yeah. So. Um, Definitely, we are not doing enough. So, so that's the, the latest report that, that, that's saying that, that, that uh, we are way behind the schedule if you want to limit uh, the, the global warming, for example, to less than two degrees by the end of the century. So, so we need to do more. And uh, uh, well, what can we do is, is that, that then uh, we could um, increase the biomass, uh, so, so carbon fixation overall. So, so that would mean that we would need to have more forests, basically. And so, so uh, uh, which is of course very, very controversial because we also need to have farming. And then uh, this vertical farming is, is uh, one, uh, um, one possible way of going forward. So, so that produces some um, uh, uh, crops um, fruits and, and, and um, those things that that, uh, that are edible. So um, um, I think globally it's not going to solve the, the big problems, but then it's going to help locally uh, with the, the food production issues. And then definitely, in, especially in Singapore, so so we don't have land area uh, for well that much. So so we have about two square kilometers of rainforest here. So. Um, I think we need to preserve all of that that, that we have left. Yeah, okay, I, mean, so. I would say from the point of view of climate change, agree entirely we're not doing enough. Um, if you look at the statistics that are coming out on CO2 concentrations, pretty concerning. Um, we're seeing in Australia more extreme um, climate climate events of flooding and bushfires and things like that. Is that connected to climate change? Well, I mean, most people believe it is, but you know, it's a very difficult thing to prove. But certainly in the last few years, we've had some really crazy weather. 
Um, I don't, you know, I, I don't think we're doing enough to address climate change. Um, sustainable agriculture and small cities. Yeah, look, there's some really innovative stuff coming out with um, LED lighting and, um, and protected agriculture. But I agree with what Jaco says. I think this is, it will be really important in reducing food transport costs um, for, for, some, for some food items. But you know, when you're looking at things like wheat and rice and staple crops that really are broad acre crops, um, we are still going to need to farm them at scale. And the last question will be on the uh, symbiotic relationship between plants and uh, microbes. So does both panelists have anything to add on? Yeah, so uh, there are results that uh, um, the, the microbes also boost plant health. So, so it's not only pathogens, so, so there are also beneficial uh, microbes and then um, in, in, the, in the leaves and, and the roots, so, so both. So, so and, and actually we need to study more about that. So uh, in, um, we need to reduce the amount of fertilizer use, for example, also. That, that's also contributing to the climate change. So, so the, this, this phosphorus amounts uh, in, in the, in, in the um, uh, fresh waters, for example, it increases algae production and all that. So, um, so um, yeah, we, we need to do more research on that. So, for example, I'm looking at the tropical soils in here. So uh, a lot of it is unknown. So, so uh, we've done some metagenomic sequencing here, and then uh, more than 50% of, of the reeds can, can't be mapped to any kingdom. So we, we just don't know who lives there and what, that, what they are doing. OK. Yeah, I could just add to that that um, certainly from the point of view of um, we've known for quite some time that um, the you know things like rusts that infect uh, leaves of plants um, there are whole whole um, communities of microbes that live on on plant leaves epiphyllous epiphyllous things and they can contribute to uh, reducing the growth of pathogens that that has been shown. Whether that could be scaled out and used in a commercial context, I don't know. People have tried and it's been a difficult thing, but I think that's just a reflection of the complexity of ecology. And I think it's really important not to, not to lose that. Um, it, it, and we, we have to a fair extent with agriculture uh, and maybe it's time to embrace that again. The same, the same can be said with soil-borne diseases. Um, we know that there are things that suppress soil-borne diseases, microbes, um, plant, um, exudates and things like that. So complex systems and sure that the microbes um, do contribute. It's, it's part of the whole picture. Okay, thank you. It's a very wonderful and insight, uh, insight provided by both our panelists. So next, I'd like to come to the uh, end of the Q&A sections and we have a special announcement as I have mentioned at the start. So in February, 2022, Pet Bio, together with uh, Novogen, has launched a grant program to support the researcher in the plant and animal science. So the winners will walk away with a free Pet Bio high bio sequencing. So I am very pleased to announce the winner on this very special day. And we have Dr. Jun Li for, from Kakushuin University. His title, what title is the complete determination of W chromosome sequence of the domesticated sequence. Bobby Mori. And second, we have Dr. Xie Yi Chun from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Her work title is Metabolic Processes of Functional Compound in Hotania Koyuta uh, Tam, a perspective of, from genomics. So this plant in Chinese is also called Yu Xin Chao. So may I first have uh, Dr. Li to introduce yourself? Yes. Uh, hi, nice to meet you. Uh, I'm E. Yungu at the Gakshuin University in Japan. And I'm doing research about the genomic evolution of Lepidopteran species. And uh, I'm very glad and honored to be awarded this grant. Thank you, Dr. Li. So next we have uh, Dr. Xie. Uh, Dr. Xie? Yes. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Yeah, my research is mainly focused on the uh, agrogenomics and also the uh, production of edible fungi. So my current focus is mainly on the evolution and uh, development of several crops 
and edible fungus. Yeah. All right, thank you. So congratulations to our both winners. The uh, AMIT will be contacting you shortly on the uh, details of the uh, awards. So, and here I wish you all the best for the research. As for the other entries, you will be also be working away with a voucher for your next NGS services. So do follow us on our social media platform for more information. And that came, that comes to the end of our webinar uh, for today. But uh, before you uh, end, but before we end the Zoom section, we do hope that you can uh, uh, participate in our survey at the end of the uh, event. Thank you. Have a very great day, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.